Shabbat Shalom, everyone. It's Rebecca Levis, and it's time to study Torah together. Let me ask you a question. If I was to tell you that there was a leader that would not deceive you, would not lie to you, and would keep all of his promises, would you want to know that leader? I would, and I do. His name is Jesus, the Messiah. And today we're going to be studying a brand new book in the Torah called the book of Exodus, or in Hebrew, Shemot. And so we are going to be looking at um, the character of God in a way that you've never seen him before. And you're also going to see that it is also another book, just like Genesis, a book of beginnings. You're going to see the beginning of a nation or the birth of a nation. And that's one of the exciting things about this book of Exodus is that it's about new beginnings. And I think in our country right now, it's a perfect time to talk about new beginnings under a great and powerful God. And so that's what we're doing today. We're going to start the book now and I'll share my screen. I want to say welcome to those who are new. I have a couple more new people, um, Evangelina and Lisa, and a couple others. I can't remember your name. Sorry, I'm so sorry. But uh, welcome to Sparky's tour time. I know you're going to learn a lot. Today's study is a uh, a little long, but I'm going to move fast. So go grab your workbooks, grab your notebooks for your Hebrew words, and let's get started. We're going to start with our um, prayer that is said prior to Torah study. So it's in blue. Let's say it together. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Ha'olam, Asher Kiddishanu Be'mitzvotav Vitzevanu La'asok Be'devrei Torah which means, blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King, he's King of the universe, who sanctifies us with his commandments or his instructions and commands us to busy ourselves or to read and meditate on the words of his Torah. And that's exactly what we're going to do right now in the book of Exodus, or in Hebrew, Shemot. Shemot means names. It's the plural of uh, the word Shem, which is name. And here it is, the second book of the five books of Moses. And you can see the Shin, the Mem, the Vav, and the Tav. Now, I am going to be starting a, a beginning Hebrew class in the spring, and I'll be announcing that, where if you learn your 22 letters, this is going to be much more fun for you. But for now, um, just hang in there and write them down as you see them. So we are going to be in the book of Exodus, starting chapter 1-1 and going through chapter 6-1. Then we're going to go into the New Testament, the Brit Hadashah, in Acts and 1 Corinthians. Uh, one dimension, again, if you see these bracketed paraphrase, uh, I mean, um, parentheses in green, it just means where you can find those words in our etymological dictionary that we use in our class. It's called the Etymological Dictionary of Biblical Hebrew, and you can order that online, and it's by Samson Hirsch, H-I-R-S-C-H. So let's get started. So the, the portion of scripture that we're in today, in the very first book of uh, a chapter of Exodus, begins like this. These are the names of the children of Israel who were coming to Egypt. Now, this is the exact same phrase from Bereshit in um, Genesis uh, chapter 46, which ties these two books together. It's like this scarlet thread. It's a continuing story. Now, chapters and verses were not added till much later in the scripture. Um, so probably in the early scriptures, in the not probably for sure, they did not have uh, chapters and verses. They, it was all one continuous scroll with just spaces between uh, different books. And so um, this is a continuing story of God's redemption. Now it starts with Jacob and his family, 70 males, plus probably more than just 70. 70 is a rounded off number. Um, it's counting the males in the um, tribe of Jacob and his sons. And so they're traveling down to Egypt. And what is the message that we're to learn from this part of scripture? 
your redemption is coming. And it's coming in a blaze of miracles. They're coming as signs to an unbelieving world. So remember that. We're going to tie that together in the end of this teaching. They're coming to show you a future redemption. It's going to come with a blaze of miracles. And they're going to be signs to an unbelieving world or the nations around Egypt. So um, the book of Exodus actually can be divided into six periods. And let's just run through them real quick. First of all, God's deliverance of his people from Egypt, the slavery of Egypt, then the wilderness wandering, then God's giving them the covenant on Mount Sinai, then the tabernacle blueprint, which was the tent of worship in the desert. <clears throat> then we're going to have a section where Israel is not faithful and it's about infidelity and then god reconciling them and then a completion of the tabernacle in the wilderness so that's what this book of exodus is going to be leading us through just like genesis the book of exodus is all about beginnings as i said the beginning of a nation a worship system and unimaginable miracles so it's a god-centered book the book of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was identifying, um, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was identifying himself as different from all the other pagan gods in Egypt. So God identifies himself in the following ways. He was the one true God, and he was above all other gods. He was creator of all things, yet outside of his creation. The area of his dominion was eternal and without boundaries, and he could control the elements. And we've seen this in the New Testament, and it began here. And he can also yet be very present and near. So this is what this book is about. God showing himself his true identity to Israel, to Egypt, and the surrounding nations. So let's review where we left off last week. The Israelites are now in the land of Goshen, and it's right at the top of the Nile. It's called the Nile Delta, and they've been there now 350 years approximately and had become a huge multitude of people. Now, the Egyptians, remember, came from Noah's son Ham, but they were ruled by Semite brothers from the land of Canaan called the Hyksos. Now, Pharaoh's capital was in the city of Goshen, and in the ancient name, it was called Avaris, and was thought to be ruled by these Hyksos, or what the Bible calls um, kings, yet pharaohs. And so in the um, extra biblical writings about these pharaohs in this period in Egypt, they believe many of the rabbis, that they were ruled by these shepherd kings that were really from the land of Canaan who came down and conquered Egypt. And there's much debate over the time period, but um, it would make sense to see this in that light because it could be a reason why um, Joseph and his family were given such favor and such great uh, land at the prime place where everything would grow, the delta of the Nile. And so it is believed that they ruled for about 200 years right before and during Joseph's journey into Egypt. And this could explain, like I said, one of the reasons they found favor since they were distant relatives. Various archaeologists, however, I've read a lot and researched this, there's a lot of biblical and secular um, archaeologists that disagree on the dating of these shepherd kings. And I just think it's interesting. I'm throwing it out there. It doesn't talk about this in our Bibles, but um, it is interesting and you can read about that yourself. Uh, and it's also mentioned by the great historian Flavius Josephus, who was a first century first century believer and wrote about the history of the Jewish people. So he also mentioned these Hyksos shepherd kings. And so I wanted to add that just for your own information. And then if you look it up in Wikipedia, the Hyksos rulers of Egypt, um, this should be Hyksos. I'm going to correct that. Oops. Thank you. 
Okay, so Avaris is the modern city of today, Tel al daba or Ramses. And so here it is writing about it, the period of the Hyksos, the capital being Avaris, right up in here. And you can see the, the Nile River, and over here is Israel. This is the Dead Sea. So they're in the land of Goshen. That's where our story begins. So in this book of Exodus, the Abrahamic covenant continues. And this was God's promise, remember, to Abraham in Genesis 15. He said, look up at the stars, so shall your offspring be. And the offspring in Hebrew is the word Zerah. Zerah means a seed. So the seed of Abraham would have a multitude of offspring and they were be given the land of Canaan. So we see that here in Genesis 15, it's continuing right on into the lives now of Jacob and his sons. Stars and people really can't be counted now on the earth, but they do have names, don't they? And in the Bible in Psalm 147, it says, God numbers the stars and calls them by name. So we're still tracking the two seed lines that we talked about in the book of Genesis, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent or the adversary. And this is about two battling kingdoms, not specific people necessarily, but through history, it would be those that love God and follow him and those that rebel and wanna go their own way. And that is the adversary against God and his people. And so we're gonna continue that theme right on now through the book of Exodus. So I wanted to bring up this um, uh, review from when we were in Genesis to show you that we talked about Adam and Eve having a covenant with God, then Noah had a covenant, and that involved a sign, which was the rainbow, and then the Abrahamic covenant was a sign of the blood or the innocent dying for the guilty. And now we're in the Mosaic, coming to the Mosaic covenant. And so I wanted to show you that each one of these covenants are building on another foundation. And we're watching a pattern that started in the Garden of Eden. And the whole purpose of these increase revelations through these covenants is that finally when the messiah comes on the scene all these covenants will be fulfilled in yeshua hamashiach jesus the messiah or jesus christ so i want to show you that uh, tree in the very beginning with adam and his wife and then in the end we're going to see the kingdom of god um, uh, shown in the final book in Revelation, where we have the right to eat from this tree of life and live forever. And uh, Jesus was called the second Adam, and we're called the church, his bride. So this is the overall big, big picture. There'll be words of the covenant. There'll be a sign and a seal. The sign will be the blood in this story. And so um, I wanted to review that for those of you who are just jumping in right now. So Shemot actually, Shem comes from a verb meaning Shema, and it means to identify, it also means a name or to name something. And here's where you find it in your etymological dictionary. Now, interesting, you've heard this word before, Shema. It's a kinetic, uh, phonetic cognate of the word to hear. So look at the, how these words are related. The shin and the mem, the shin and the mem, they share two of the three root letters, so they're going to be related. So when you hear a voice, you can identify the name and see how they're related. Shema means to hear, and when we hear a voice, we identify it. When I hear my husband on the phone, I know his voice, and that's what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice, and they know it's me. And so these words are related. So this is the book that introduces us to the star character of Exodus, which is Moses, or I'm going to be calling him off and on Moshe, so you can get used to his Hebrew name. And he was the man whom God chose to identify 
the voice of God to the Jewish people and to Pharaoh and the nations around them. And all at the end of this book would know his name. And see, his name is Shem. And that's what they call God, Hashem, the name. And so I wanted to show you all these connections to the book's name, to meaning to hear, and to hear his voice and know him and be able to identify his voice. So this is what we're going to do in this wonderful, exciting story. So I love this little uh, joke I saw online. Moses was the first person with a tablet that could download data from the cloud. Isn't that cute? I saw that on somebody's website. So in the book of uh, Exodus or Shemot, we, we start with the death of Jacob and all of the brothers of Joseph and Joseph. They're all dead now. And this new Egyptian pharaoh is now in charge. He was now going to be king over all of Egypt, but he didn't remember and he didn't know all the favor and grace that God had given the uh, Egyptian people due to uh, Joseph and Jacob. And so um, he was about to make it worse for the people that were now uh, benefiting in Egypt, suddenly with this new pharaoh, there would be a change of scenery. And I think that's also true in our nation, isn't it? So new person comes in, you're going to see change. So God is about to fulfill, however, the promise he had made to Abraham. So this isn't all negative, nor is what we're seeing today on our news channels all negative. God is still doing his redemption process. And this is the time not for Christians to grow weak or fearful or quiet. This is the time for Christians to shine, to be about your father's business. These are exciting times where Christians can stand up and show the world what it means to love well, to lead well, and to be loyal to the one who can make all the difference in the world. And that is the one true God. And that's what we're seeing done here. What seems evil will actually be turned around to actually change the world and change people. So keep that in mind. So what was Moshe's mission? As a man, he was gonna function as a prophet and the Jewish people call Moses the number one prophet above all prophets. He's the only one that God spoke to face to face. He would also act as a redeemer and then as a high priest to intercede for God's people. So we're going to see that unfold in this book. Moses' birth and early years were filled with wonder, exhibiting God's power, blessings, and favor in the palace of Pharaoh. Now, very little is said from the time Pharaoh's brought to the palace to the point where he goes out one day and he's a grown man. So we can assume something from this uh, period of time that might have been going on because of the history of what went on in the palace of the pharaohs. First of all, Egypt was the mightiest nation of all in the ancient world, but also the most pagan. Now look, they had gods for everything. They had hundreds of gods. And a lot of them were about animals and birds and crocodiles and snakes and gods and goddesses. Um, they were a very pagan group of people, even though they were powerful. So let's look at Moshe's name itself. The Hebrew name Moshe is actually a mirror image to one of the names of the God of Israel. Remember I said God is going to be called Hashem, the name? Here it is, Hebrews read from right to left. So here is Hashem, the name of God. And look, if you turn that around, it's the name of Moshe. Isn't that amazing? Look at these letters. It's a mirror image of what God was going to do to reveal himself and identify himself through Moses. So Hashem is the name for the unspeakable name of God. And this is called the Tetragrammaton. And you're going to see these letters show up in this teaching later. 
this is his name that he's going to reveal to God, uh, uh, to Moses in this story. So his name, Moshe, means to be drawn out of water. The rabbis teach that Moshe functioned as the very first redeemer of Israel and that the Messiah be like bookends. Moses, Messiah. Hashem working through Moses and ultimately Moses doing similar things that the Messiah would do. And remember I said Torah is all about pointing to foreshadowings and patterns of the Messiah? Well, that continues through this book of Exodus. So Moses was from the tribe of Levi, and he would also function as a priest. Now, the priesthood hadn't been given yet, but keep in mind that Moses was a Levite, and so was his brother Aaron. So they would mirror the work of God's hand by acting as a mediator between Hashem and the nation Israel that is going to be birthed out of Egypt. Now, I said his name means to be drawn out of the water, and I'm going to use Moshe as his name. And Moshe was saved by his mother. When he was born, there was an edict to drown all the males because now this new pharaoh was threatened by this huge nation. And he said, I'm going to put out a new law and I want all male babies to be drowned and thrown in the Nile. But the mother, the Hebrew mother, put him in an ark. And it's, it's translated basket, but it really is the word ark. It's the word teva. And it's only found twice in all of scripture. Once when Noah saved the whole world in an ark. And then when Moses would redeem God's first nation that he set apart. And it would also be in an ark. And these are the only two places you see the Hebrew word teva. So Noah's ark was first to save people from God's judgment. And Moses would save the nation of Israel from the slavery under Egypt. Now here's a backstory regarding Moses' birth. In the Talmud, it's written that because of Pharaoh's order, Moses' parents, Amran and Yochebed, Yochebed, her name, Chabed is Chabod or glory. So Yah, it's Yah, Yah's glory or God's glory, the mother, Yochebed and the father Amran decided not to have any more children. But Moses' sister, his oldest sister, Miriam, at the age of six, was a prophetess who prophesied that her parents would actually have a baby boy who would save Israel's people. The Talmud also says that at his birth, the whole room filled with light, and they knew. He was a special child. Does this sound familiar? Think about Isaiah 9-1 when it says the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Isaiah was foreshadowing and talking and prophesying about the Messiah. And here in the Talmud, the oral law passes down that when Moses was born, his face was all aglow. And that's exactly what happened on the top of Mount Sinai. When he came down, they said they couldn't look at his face. So there's some ties here that we don't see in our Bible. And just know that every detail of our Bible can't be written down. It, it, you find a backstory in a lot of these extra biblical writings. Now, they're not part of the original canon. So um, you can just take it for what it's worth. But it does make sense to me. And they said, and when Moses was born, they saw that he was good. Now, I want you to see that some translations say that he was beautiful, or they saw that he was um, uh, a, a good child or a perfect child, or um, they use any word but tov, he was good. Now, in Hebrew, they're taking you back to a word that was used in the very first of the creation. Everything God was about to do to prepare the world for his kingdom, he called good. And that's exactly what they said about this child who was born with his face full of light. He was a good child, meaning the same word. It was complete. And good means complete and ready to function and design and purpose. And that's exactly what happened at the birth of, of Moses. And I think it's beautiful 
how these Hebrew words can be seen uh, linguistically to other things in the Bible. Now, the rabbis are very familiar with this kind of study, and this is why I love to study with the rabbis. So I only quote them when they agree with biblical truth or um, things that we know that are true as Christians in the, and reflected in the New Testament. So some of these things I throw out there just to show you what the Jewish people believe, and then some of it you can take or leave. So it's up to you. So in Exodus, Moses' parents and sister are not named. Isn't that interesting? However, two midwives are named. Now, one is called Shiroth, or Shifra, sorry. And tradition in the Talmud says this was actually Moses' mother. And Pua, and they say Pua was Miriam, the sister. Now, it doesn't say that in our Bible, but that's what the sages say, that these are their Hebrew names of actual Yochebed and Miriam. Now, uh, Shifra means to make clear or to brighten or to be balanced. And um, it's interesting that if it was the mother, then she would know clearly how to take care of this baby. And then she would live out her, her purpose to uh, keep a balance. And I think that's interesting. And if Pua was actually Miriam, her name means to cry out or to coo or to burst forth. So if Miriam, the sister, was in fact a prophetess, she would speak out and cry out or coo. So that could, that could be true. So anyway, God made them houses, it said, and they were named in this book, not Yochebed, not Amram, but these two. They were women. And it says that God made them houses, not literal houses, but the rabbis say dynasties came from them. That Yochebed descendants be became some of the Kohanim or the priests, the Levite priests, and that Miriam's descendants were associated with royalty through King David, through marriage. And this was also talked about by the sages. Their names will also be in a book in the end of Revelation, which is the book of life, because it said they did what was right in God's eyes instead of what Pharaoh said. So both women refused to kill the male babies, and they actually saved their lives. Now, as we know the story, Moses was put in the basket, and that the uh, Pharaoh's daughter and her maidens came down to the Nile and found Moses' basket among the reeds. Now, remember, these women did not kill this baby, and they were considered righteous in their generation. And look, this is the first recorded act of actual civil disobedience where people would obey God rather than man. So today, when they're talking about civil disobedience, it first started with women. Isn't that interesting? Look at Acts 5, 28 and 29. Peter's brought before the Jewish religious leaders, the Sanhedrin. And here's what he says. Um, here's what they said to Peter. These are the Sanhedrin speaking. We gave you strict orders not to teach in the name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us responsible for this man's blood. But Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. And so uh, we see this also echoed in the New Testament that these women would do what was righteous or right in God's eyes. And so that's how we're to pray as Christians today. Lord, let me do what's right in your eyes. Let me speak truth. Let me live in love. And let me be about my dad's business, sharing with the world the good news that they don't have to depend on religious systems. They don't have to depend on government. They don't have to depend on the parties. That The one that they need to know and depend on and trust in is the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. And so that's what I'm all about. So Moses' early years, he grew up in Pharaoh's palace. So what would that have been like? He would have received the finest education in all of Egypt. 
He would have been taught in culture, religious practice, battleground strategies, science, architecture, astronomy, and art and agriculture. So Moses became a man full of wisdom and skill and knowledge. And this would serve him well, as he was the one chosen to lead this whole multitude of people out of the hands and grip of the cruel taskmasters of Egypt and out into the desert as free people. So he lived in the palace of Pharaoh until about the age of 40, the Bible says. So now he's a grown man full of wisdom and knowledge. So his life would be filled with wonder and he was the herald to the nations that Adonai was first over all other of their little mini gods that were in Egypt. Another interesting thing that you wouldn't see except in Hebrew is that, that Moses was showing everybody that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was first. And that word first is Aleph. And it means the same word in a mirror image, a wonder. Isn't it amazing? You see the Aleph Lamed, and this is a pay, but an ending pay looks different. It has a long tail. But you see the pay, the Lamed, and the Aleph, just as you did here. Aleph, Lamed, pay, pay, Lamed, Aleph. And that the first God was about to show them all the wonders that he had coming from his strong right hand. And so I explain here the pay and the fay, how they uh, are similar, um, but the um, fay has no dot in it or a dogish. So those of you who have taken my class, remember that, that this is actually a fay, fay so feet, and this is a pay. Okay, so for those that don't know Hebrew, I'm gonna move on. So uh, I'm gonna move on. Elif Aleph is also the word for an ox or a calf. Now, remember, I said this God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is first over all the other gods. And later in this book, we're going to see the Egyptians first was going to be uh, worshipped as a calf, the golden calf. And this is where the infidelity comes in. And we're going to see that later in this story. But now that we're on this word, I wanted to show you that God is first, not the calf. And the, again, it's a linguistic clue here in Hebrew. So I'll move on. Okay, so what are Moses' shortcomings? He was a real man. He had emotion, he had strengths, and he had weaknesses. His weakness that mainly we're going to see here is that he, Moses be, takes things into his own hands several times in this book, and he uses his anger. Now, that is one of the um, blessings spoken over the tribe of Levi with the, was that they would be, uh, they'd have a problem with anger. And it's played out even in Moses' life. And we're going to see it all through this book of Exodus, where Moses gets upset and he takes things in his own hands. And sometimes it don't turn out so well, although God does use it. So let's go back to the story now. He's 40 years old. And it says, one day he ventured out among the Hebrews and saw one of his fellow Hebrews slaves being mistreated by the Egyptian man. Moses looked around to see who was watching. And here's the first time it happened. He took things into his own hand and he killed the man and he buried him in the sand. Now, the next day, Moses went out again, and guess what? There's two of his own people fighting. And he comes up to him and he goes, why are you hitting your brethren? And he took matters again into his own hands and intervened. And one of them said, oh, who appointed you as dignitary over us? Will you murder me like you murdered the Egyptian? Uh-oh. Moses was scared to death. He realized that what he thought nobody saw was actually seen and he it was heard also by pharaoh and pharaoh was furious and he wanted to kill moses so here's where moses fled from egypt and he went to an area called midian and midian was not just one city there were many tribes there it was an area of midian and i'm going to show you that in a little bit on a map 
So at this time, now he's gone. Pharaoh has put taskmasters over the Israelites to um, help build his own kingdom and fill his own storehouses and treasuries. Now, this is exactly what happens when people are successful. They become um, more harsh and more bossy and more prideful and more arrogant. This goes on in every cycle of every kingdom, whether it's um, the Persian kingdom, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Romans. Um, this is a pattern that we'll see all through scripture. And so he becomes harsh over the people. And this is also the very first pogrom principle. And we see it in full force. It means forced labor with the goal to break them down or exterminate them eventually. First use them and then abuse them. And also, this is a pattern we see where there's arrogance and pride. Um, and we see this in every culture in every period of time. And sometimes that will be our very downfall, but God uses that. So don't be upset with what's happening today. God is not finished. He's not finished with uh, our country. He's not finished with Donald Trump. He's not finished with Joe Biden. He's not finished with any of us. So keep your chin up, pay attention. So let's go back to the story. In the future, God would use Jew and Gentile to help build his kingdom. And this is the beginning of the story. It's a story of bringing out an abused, overworked bunch of slaves and giving them freedom and changing their mindset in their freedom walk. And that's exactly what happens to nations is that they go through cycles of you know, hardship and then they cry out to God and then he blesses them and then they become powerful and then they become apathetic and then they become immoral and then there's a breakdown and then there's bondage and pain and then they cry out to God again. And this is what we're seeing right now. Our nation, at least the Christians I know, are on their knees crying out to God to forgive us for any way that we have offended him or we haven't stepped up to the plate and done our part as the church today. So God is working in everyone, in the world system and in his body. So God's treasuries one day are going to be full and they're going to be full of people. That's what's going to be in God's house, people. Not things, not gold, not silver, not money, not power or prestige. It's going to be people, people. And I always say that. So let's move on. So after Moses goes to Midian, <clears throat> he meets um, the shepherdesses at the well. And now this is where we see again, just like all through Genesis, we saw the patriarchs coming to wells. And remember, I said, whenever you see an altar being built or a well, God is about to do something miraculous. Here is where Moses meets um, the shepherdess and the seven daughters of the uh, priest of Midian. And um, at this time, what's going on in Egypt is that the death of Pharaoh occurred and the Hebrew people groaned and cried out for help from slavery. And this cry for help would eventually foreshadow another cry for help during the Romans' harsh time, when the Roman rule was harsh, where they were throwing Christians to the lions, and there was a persecuted church. And look, the word for help they're crying out for help from this slavery and they're groaning under the weight of this oppression. And the word for help in Hebrew right here is Shua, Sha'a. And it's Jesus' name, Yeshua. So you can see here that these are related. Jesus is the help in time of need. So I wanted to show you that. These are people crying out for help. And that's what we're doing today, aren't we? We're saying, Lord, we need you. Our country needs you. So it said God heard their cry. God remembered his covenant. 
that he had with the patriarchs and he saw the children of Israel and he knew, he knew what was going on and God knows today what's going on. So all this was going on in Egypt at the time that now Moses is in Midian and he meets these shepherdesses and he's invited to their home and he's given the daughter Zipporah and he marries her and he lives there for another 40 years. So pay attention to numbers. He's 40, then he goes and he spends 40 years again and now he's 80 and he's in Midian. So the story goes on and it gets more and more exciting. So while there, um, it's the custom in Egypt to mourn for the Pharaoh and cease from all work. And in, in Egypt culture, it was 72 days. So look, that's two and a half months of rest for the um, downtrodden. And so um, remember they, they uh, all of Egypt went to Jacob's burial at the cave of Machpelah and all of the Egyptian rulers and, and, and um, important people all had this huge 200 people that went to bury Jacob. Now this is a new Pharaoh. He doesn't know Jacob and Joseph and all that, but you can see that now there's another long period, two and a half months where the Israelites are given some rest. And it's right before the time when they're going to need their strength where Moses is going to come and set them free. So see, God's perfect plan is unfolding. So they've been steeped. Meanwhile, these people, they're God's people, but don't forget there's 350 years they've been down there and they've been exposed to this pagan culture, sexual perversion, infant sacrifice, brutal and toxic environments, and an obsession with death and the afterlife. One example that I was researching was um, King Tut's tomb. He was known as the boy king. He died at the age of 18. He had a four chamber tomb. And in there were over 2000 articles. They found um, all these articles for the soul of the person to enjoy. See how crazy this was? So the pagan culture believed that when you died, you were, you'd put all these things in their tomb so that they could enjoy the afterlife. This is very much like many false religions today that talk about coming back, reincarnation. Uh, coming back is all these great things. And so this is part of this pagan philosophy is that there's this afterlife that they're going to enjoy and they're taking things with them. You can't take anything with you people except other people. But look what they found. They found gold uh, thrones and chests of jewelry, gilded beds, even chariots, alabaster jars full of perfume, weapons, and religious articles. Wow. These can be seen, by the way, in a museum in Cairo. I think it's very interesting what was going on in the culture in those days. And the reason I'm saying this is because many of these things are going to come forth in the thinking of these slaves. And God is trying to change their stinking thinking as he's bringing them out and they're wandering through the wilderness experience. And they're gonna have to shake off a lot of the stuff from their old life and also from the culture around them. And that is us today. More than ever, we have to shake off our past and the things that hold us back from being everything God wants us to be today. And so um, that's why I want to spend a minute right here on that. So God was waiting for their hearts to change. And he heard their cry. See, sometimes things have to get really bad before people cry out. So that's my prayer right now for our culture and our nation. Um, it's going to get worse. Um, uh, God wants them to have a heart that wants to serve him, not the culture. And I'll tell you, it's very clear in the New Testament. Jesus was very clear about what would be going on in the last days, right before his return. He talked about a culture that would be oppressive, a, a culture that would be God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. It says in the book of Romans, they would be ruthless, faithless, senseless, godless, and this is what we're seeing today. So we're in the birth pangs 
in the last days, we're seeing it in our culture. I'm not saying the world is coming to an end tomorrow, but we are the generation that's beginning to see things being tipped upside down. And Jesus said, when you see these things happening, comfort one another with my promises. And so I want to give comfort to people listening to this, that there is comfort in Jesus. He says, this is what's going to be going on, but believe in me. Believe that I give you eternal life. I can raise the dead. And I have a place in another kingdom. It's, it's reserved for you. And so, although um, God, they hadn't been serving the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they're about to. They're about to. Look at the word to serve. It's the word abad in Hebrew. And it means to work subject to another's will. Now look, slavery is being unwillingly working under the another's will. That's called slavery. And that's called servitude, subservient servitude. But when you willingly serve another for another's will, that's called servitude. So subservient servitude. Jesus, when he came, was willing to lay down his life to serve you and I by his blood being shed. And Jesus said, no one takes this life from me. I lay it down on my own accord. So look at the difference between living a life like a slave versus following the one who gave his life willingly for us. Wow, that's the one I want to serve. That's the one whose promises are true. That's the one who tells the truth and doesn't deceive us. And so that's the one we should be following. So heads up, chin up, people. So at the age of 80 now, it says that Moses was tending his father-in-law's sheep. Now, Moses didn't have anything. When he ran off, he didn't take all the, the wealth of Egypt with him. He had nothing. So here he is now. 40 years, he's married, he has children, and he's tending his father-in-law's sheep. So he's become a shepherd. So see, Moses is not only going to be a prophet, a redeemer, and a priest-like uh, redeemer of, of the people in Egypt, but he's also the shepherd. He's acting like a shepherd. So he's out at the edge, way, way over by Mount Sinai. The Bible calls it Mount Horeb. And it is Mount Sinai. And he sees this burning bush. And we know all about this. We saw this in the movie, Charlton Heston. But look at what the word is in Hebrew. He saw a burning bush. It's the same word, sina, sana, right here. And it's burning bush with thorns. Because Sinai, Mount Sinai, is the mountain of thorns. That's the name of it. And we're going to see this show up later in the book of Exodus. But the same thorn bush is on fire. And coming from this thorn bush is a voice. And it's the presence, or it says the angel of Adonai. And it's this name, the yod Hey vav Hey. And I'm going to show you how the angel of Adonai and how it's connected to these four Hebrew letters in a minute. And um, all these connections are really only seen in Hebrew. So he sees the burning bush and he goes up and this angel of the Lord speaks to him. And he says, I am the father of your, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he says, take off your sandals. You're standing on holy ground. And that in, in Hebrew is Kadosh Adama, holy ground. And it means that there's a holy mission. So he says, take off your shoes. There's holy ground here. And with this holy ground comes a holy mission. It's interesting that the priests also took off their shoes when they ministered barefoot in the very first tabernacle in the desert. So I wanted to show you that connection, that the priesthood would be standing also on holy ground barefoot. So without sandals, it's as if there's nothing standing between the mission 
from God and the one standing on the Kadosh Adama, the holy ground. Nothing between you and full obedience to what the mission is. And that's how we can look at our lives as we follow the one true God who manifested himself in the Messiah, Yeshua. So moving on, Moses at first was re resistant and he had all these reasons why he couldn't do it. And perhaps he was even fearful um, because he had all these questions in his heart. And it's the same question sometimes we ask when we consider following Jesus. We say things like, well, who am I? I and mean, what is this going to mean to me? What, who am I and why am I here? And who are you, God? I don't know if I can trust you with my life. And then he says, who should I tell them sent me when I go to Egypt to go set the people free? So it's the same thing that we say. You know, who am I to go? Are they going to believe me? Who should I say sending me? And, and what if they don't believe me? Or if you're now living for Jesus and you have others, maybe in your sphere of influence that you want to talk to about the good news, and maybe you've been holding back. And it's time to shake that all away and say, this is the time, never before in history has it been more important to share the good news of Jesus than right now. So he said, I'm sending you to Egypt to release my people from bondage, and I will teach you what to say. So that's exactly what happens when we go out in faith, is that we just go and say, well, okay, Lord, I don't know this person that well, but you told me to go and you'll tell me what to say when I get there. I'll trust your Holy Spirit that lives in me. And so he says, I'm going to also bring you back to worship me on this mountain. Now, you don't see this in, in your English translation. We just see the word worship me, but it's the same word to serve him. It's the word abad right here. And he, it's the servitude willingly serve me on this mountain. So God wants a willing servant heart, not a subservient heart, that we do it out of regret, or we do it out of remorse, or we do it out of guilt or obligation. That is not true faith. That's religion. You know, cross yourself, kneel, bells and smells, worship, make, you know, funny sounds, uh, sit and smell incense. This is man-made religion. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a heart that's broken, that says, I'm a broken person. That's what evil means in Hebrew. I'm broken. And in my brokenness, I need you to fix me. And he does it by filling us with his spirit so we could have a new mind, not a mind of slavery back there, but leaving that, shaking it off and becoming transformed by the renewing of our mind. That's what the scripture says. So this is what's happening to Israel as a nation. So he makes all these excuses. I'm slow of mouth and slow of tongue. And then God says, Aaron will speak for you and his heart will be willing and he will be your mouth and you will be like God to him. So again, Moses is going to be functioning under the godlike qualities of Hashem. And that's why he said, take your shoes off, Moses. You have a holy mission here. And Moses says, who should I tell him that you are? And here's what he says, a yay, a share, a yay in Hebrew. Literally, if you were going to translate, that means I am, will be what I am, I will be. And we, we see it translated in our Bibles, I will be what I will be. That is my name forever. Tell them, I am sent you, or a yay, sent you. Let me show you the beauty of these letters. When it says, I am Adonai, the yod heh vav He is the God of your fathers. You shall call me that name forever. This is who God identifies. Remember that name, Shemot, means to identify. He's identifying himself to the people as the yod heh vav He, And he says, that's my name forever. And in the New Testament, the Apostle Yochanan, or John, in the book of Revelation, called him the one who was and is 
and is to come. It's the exact same concept. The one who was and is and always will be. The eternal one. And boy, this is the best definition for truth. When people say, well, what is the truth? You have your truth. I have my truth. Here's a great definition for truth. What was, what still is, and always will be. The truth is, this is an earring. It always was an earring once it was formed. It always will be. And it is now. Always will be. So truth is something that doesn't change with the culture. It's not progressive. Truth remains stable and steadfast. And that's the foundation. And you can build things on that. And it can, it can have a different look to different people. But the foundation, the sowed in Hebrew, and that's the same word for ground, by the way, Adama, is the sowed, the ground. And so the foundation is truth. So in order to know truth, you have to know God's word. So we see a lack of God's word, people knowing it. Even his own Jewish people don't know their Bibles. They only know what their rabbis tell them. And many of them, if you, if you quote different things in their scriptures, they have no idea what you're talking about. So that's why we as Christians study Torah so that when we speak to our Jewish brothers and sisters and relatives, family members, we speak their language. We understand where they're coming from. And this is why we have to know our Bibles backwards and forwards, read through it every year. This is why at Calvary Chapel, they go a year through God's word every three years. Some people do it every year. Know his word. There's no time like today to know his word, to meditate on it, to memorize it. So these four same Hebrew letters called the Tetragrammaton are used in this phrase in Hebrew, who was, who is, and is to come, like we see in the book of Revelation. Look, heye hove ye ye. This is what is translated in Revelation, who was and is and is to come. And look, it is all the letters of his identity. Adonai is yod he vav he. Do you see all these letters? There's nothing here but a yod, a he, a vav, or a he, all through it. So John talked about this in Revelation 4, 8. The four living beings, day and night, never stopped saying, holy, holy, holy is who? yod he vav he, who was and is and is to come. Isn't Hebrew a beautiful language? Wow. Okay, I hope you wrote that down in your workbook, in your little notebook. So Moses doubted and God said, I'm gonna give you two signs. He says, what's in your hand? And he holds up and he says, okay, a staff. And he says, take it with you. And once you let it go, he says, throw it down and it turned into a snake. And then he said, grab it by the tail and it turned back into a staff. Now, it turned into a snake, which is uh, the word, an unclean thing. So Moses wouldn't have touched this as a Jew. And it means tame or unclean. Now, the staff is called mate. See, it's got some of the same letters, but also in Hebrew, it has the letter nata. Now, Nata means a tribe. So a staff is also this word, a tribe or meaning to spread out. So God was going to use Moses' staff to help the people spread out. And we're going to see a snake appear again in the book of Exodus that, that God is going to show um, the way to be saved. And it's going to have to do with a snake. So pay attention to that. I'm just showing you that here because we're going to see it later. Now, the second thing that was going to be a sign was he said, put your hand inside your jacket and he pulls it out and it's white with some disease. Now, it wasn't the disease that we know as leprosy. It was some disease that we don't know what it is, but it was given to those who 
had a problem inward spiritually with a heart problem or a mind or an attitude and they were given this white debilitating disease but it wasn't Hansen's disease it, it, it's unknown what it was but it would be on clothes and it would be in houses and stuff like that so um, it was called Zara and it means unclean and so he says put it in your heart uh, put it in your coat. And to me, what that's saying is, if you take something and then it's done in your own hand, remember, remember I said he would be one that he would use anger and take things into his own hands. The second sign before the people would be this hand changing and coming back to being healed. And so it is a, a reflection, again, of what we're going to see happening in Moses' very life, as well as these signs to Pharaoh. So it's it's a double meaning here. It's like in scripture, you'll see a what they call duality reality, where you see it meaning literally one thing, but it'll have another meaning at another time, but it'll be parallel in its spiritual meaning called duality um, reality. So, um, so this is my thinking is that um, perhaps he had him put it in there. Could it have been symbolic of work to be done yet in Moses' heart? Remember the Egyptian when he took things into his own hand? Um, God was not only changing Israel as a nation, but he was changing Moses as a man. And God does that in our own lives as well. So Moses says, then he goes back to Jethro and he says, I got to go to Egypt. And I'm going to take my whole family. And Je Jethro gives him his blessing. And Moses takes his two sons and his wife. And on the way, he's got two sons, Eleazar and Gershon. And he takes these sons and his wife, Zipporah, and they go on their journey. On the way, Moses hadn't circumcised one of his sons. And God said he was going to kill him. And he told Zipporah, the wife, to have uh, the son circumcised or Moses would, Moses would die. So once again, we see a woman stepping up here and saving the day, saving Moses' life. She circumcised the son and then she throws it down in the sand and she quickly circumcises Eliezer and threw it at Moses' feet on the ground. And he says, she says, now you're a bridegroom of blood or now Moses was truly in covenant uh, fully. In other words, he was supposed to have done that. And the wife stepped in. And you're going to see women stepping in uh, in scripture where the husband or the male wasn't obedient and a woman will come and save things. I think it's because the woman's heart is tender. You know, in the New Testament where it says, you know, husbands love your wives as weaker vessels, that word in Hebrew, weak, means tender and flexible, not rigid. And so we as women have tender hearts that are flexible and malleable, where sometimes men can be more rigid. And so that's what it means by being weaker, not weaker physically or weaker spiritually, but it can mean also compassionate and tender hearted and more open to the things of the spirit. And so um, that's perhaps what's happening here. Look at what foreskin means. Foreskin is what they take off and separate from the man. And because in Hebrew, this word ariel means to resist or restrict power, to limit one, and it means unyielding. Isn't it interesting what the foreskin means? So it's almost like God is taking this part of you and saying, this has got to go so that the seed can be revealed. Wow, that's huge spiritually. It's like an uncovering of the source of the seed or the next generations to come. So in the spiritual realm, we have circumcised hearts as if to say there's nothing to restrict us or limit us in our identity following God as his seed, being born of the Spirit. 
So there'll always be enmity between those two seeds and those two kingdoms. And it'll be man's kingdom versus God's kingdom. And we see it today. We see it between Israel and the other nations, and we see it between God's people, the evangelicals, the uh, people that want to preserve and care for the, unbound, the unborn baby. We want to guard and protect the home. We want to stand for religious freedom, not just for Christians, but for all people. And so the things that we stand for are biblical. And uh, I'm proud of that. And I will not change my thinking when it comes to that. So Moses and Aaron showed these signs to all the elders when they went to Israel. And all the elders then believed that they were sent by God. And so they go to Pharaoh and Adonai says, Israel is my firstborn. I have told you to let him go in order to worship me, but you refused. This is what Aaron and Moses tell Pharaoh. He says, but you refused. Well, then I will kill your firstborn. So just like Israel was going to be born as God's firstborn nation, God is saying to Pharaoh, if you don't let him go, I'm going to kill your firstborn. So it's an eye for an eye principle, or you reap what you sow. So just like they were throwing the male children into the Nile, you're going to see this come back on Pharaoh and the Egyptians. So Pharaoh's response is, who is Adonai? Who is this yod heh vav -Heh? I don't know that name. So there's this mocking spirit. And we talked about that in Genesis, that the mocking spirit would be the one that resists the things of God. And we see that in our world today as well. So Moses says, let us go out into the desert and worship him there for three days or Adonai will strike Egypt with plagues or a sword. So there's always a warning, like I said in Genesis, before God brings judgment, they're warned. And Jesus judged his culture and generation with a warning saying, here's what it's going to look like before I return. And he gave us many examples. And I already talked about that in the beginning. So I'm going to move on. So it ends with Pharaoh making their slavery worse. And they come to resent Moses coming. And they're like, look what you've done. Now he's taking away the straw. We have to go out and find it ourselves. And they are making us give the same quota of bricks to build Pharaoh's kingdom. So their labor seemed like it was in vain. But God isn't done yet. And Moses says to Adonai, you've made me now a stench to these people. You have put a sword in their hands. And so what seemed like tragedy, God is about to do something miraculous. So we see this today. I don't think it's an accident that we're studying this portion of scripture right now with what is going on in our culture. But God responded, wait till you see what my hand does to Pharaoh. He himself will drive you out with his own hand with great power and blessings and riches. And oh my gosh, this story unfolds. It just gets better and better. So let's end in the New Testament and let's look at Acts 7, 17 through 35. In this scripture, the, Stephen, one of the disciples and followers, uh, Talmudim of Yeshua, retells the story of Moses. He's standing before the leaders of Israel. And he says, he tells the story of Moses' birth, his adoption, the exile in Midian, his experience of the burning bush, Egypt, the journey out. And he identifies Moses as the redeemer of Israel. So he brings the Torah right in, because remember, there is no New Testament when Stephen was speaking. All he's doing is quoting the Torah, the prophets, the writings. So look at 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Rabbi Shaul or Paul admonishes believers to not be immature in their thinking about speaking in tongues, which in Jesus' time and in the first century believers, again, signs were given. Speaking in tongues was one of them. And he said, don't be immature when you see these signs. Have right thinking 
And again, that's what's happening in our culture today. Don't be upset. Don't be surprised when you see what things are happening. But be about your father's business and comfort one another, knowing that his promises are true, that he doesn't lie, and that we can stand on solid ground as believers. So this is just like the signs that God was about to give Moses to an unbelieving group of people in Egypt. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Well, that's it for today. I hope you're excited about what's coming. Uh, there's more Hebrew. Uh, there's more exciting stories. And I just want to encourage all of you to not be discouraged by what you see, that our trust is not in man. It's not in the Capitol. It's not in the White House. But it's before the one who loved us and died for us and is still calling you and me today to follow him. So in 2021, I pray that you would read God's word. I challenge you to go get a Bible from a friend and begin reading. If you'll read the entire book of Matthew, I believe God will speak to you personally. And then when you're done with Matthew, I want you to go to the book of Romans and see if you don't see much of what's happening today spoken about in the book of Romans. And from there, if you're still with me, go to the book of Hebrews, the, the book that was written to the Hebrews by Hebrews, and you'll see the, the story unfold beautifully as the Torah and the New Testament are brought together with the good news of the Messiah. So God bless you. Shalom Aleichem, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.